going to speak and then Matt's going to speak and then, and then. You. All right, so we are going to begin. Um, hello and welcome everyone for coming to this event. I'm looking for life on Mars, one laser pulse at a time, um, which is a lecture presented by our very own Dean and Professor of Physics, Dean Malici. Um, this talk is being held as part of the Kennedy College of Sciences Spring into Science Week and is also sponsored by, once again, Eric and Lola Chason, who also sponsored um, our lecture on Tuesday evening. Um, my name is Liz Cole and I work in the Dean's Office of the Kennedy College of Sciences and I will be moderating today's lecture. Um, just a couple of housekeeping bits before we get into it. Um, you might remember if you attended the lecture on Tuesday night, but for the webinar, we have both um, a chat feature just for like conver um, conversations back and forth, saying hi to people, and as well as a Q&A feature, which can be accessed at the bottom um, of the Zoom window. And the Q&A feature is where we'll be pulling questions from for the Q&A at the end of the lecture. So any questions you may have, please put those in the Q&A. We'll do our best to moderate both of them just to um, make sure we don't miss any questions that are put in the chat. But if you could just stick to the Q&A for the questions, that would be great. Um, and if you would like everyone to see your comments in the chat, um, just be sure to, I'm not sure if your computers default to this, but um, there's a drop down that should say panelists and attendees. So you can just drop that down and write your comment in there. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn the floor over to our Associate Dean for Research, Innovation and Partnerships, Matt Nugent, um, who if you attended the talk on Tuesday, um, Matt gave his lecture on the science of COVID-19 and its vaccines. And if you didn't get to see it, we'll have the link available um, for that shortly. So keep an eye out. So Matt, it's all yours. Great, thank you, Liz. Um, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Norini Malici. Um, Nordin received his Diplôme d'études supérieures in physics from the Hurari uh, Boumedien University of Sciences and Technology in Algeria, and his doctorate in philosophy in physics from the University of Sussex, England. Nordin's research spans a wide range that is focused on light with con uh, contributions to laser interactions with various samples and more recently to the early detection of signatures of cancers and Alzheimer's disease using laser spectroscopy and machine learning. In addition, as a member of NASA's Mars Science Laboratory mission, Dr. Malici contributes uh, to the analysis of spectroscopic data collected by the chemistry camera instrument on board of the Curiosity rover, as well as the recently landed Perseverance rover. Nordine is a professor of physics and dean of the Kennedy College of Sciences at UMass Lowell. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, fellow of the American Physical Society, fellow of the Optical Society of America, and fellow of the Scientific Research Honor Society, Sigma Psi. But most importantly, Nordin is a wonderful colleague and leader who is committed to ensuring that the Kennedy College of Sciences is a welcoming and inclusive place that is dedicated to scientific and educational excellence. Um, I have, it's my great pleasure to have had the chance to uh, get to know Nordin and to learn from him. And I think we're all gonna get to learn a bit more from him today. So Nordin, it's all yours. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, everybody who's here. I'm really, really happy to be here with you. So I will start by sharing my screen. I hope it will work. Can you see it? Is it working? Yes, yep. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you uh, again, Liz uh, for organizing all of this. Uh, this Spring to, to Science is part of uh, what we do to, uh, to get science to the public. Uh, and uh, it is thanks to uh, Eric and Lola Chesson, who uh, not only had the idea to do it, but also sponsored this, this type of event. So thank you to both of them. And thank you, Matt, also for everything that you do. And thank you for, uh, for the introduction. Uh, so today I'm going to spend well, maybe 45 minutes or so, trying to tell you about uh, some of NASA's Mars missions. And, uh, and in particular, I'll try to focus a little bit about the last two missions, the Curiosity mission and the uh, Perseverance mission uh, that just uh, landed on, on Mars. Uh, because there's so much in these missions to talk about, and because I'm just a single individual uh, as a member of this large scientific team, 
I will focus mostly on the instruments that I'm part of and mostly on uh, what we do with lasers uh, on Mars and in particular with one technology called laser induced breakdown spectroscopy. So I will to give you a flavor of what we're doing. Uh, also, uh, there'll be some videos so that you can see what we think Mars looks like. And, uh, and I'll be happy to answer questions at the end uh, uh, and, and, uh, and also your comments and so forth. So, so if you bear with me, so we're going to talk about uh, looking for life on Mars. Really, it should be looking for signs of life, signatures of life on Mars, one laser pulse at a time. So this is, you can see here, the planet Earth and planet Mars. And the question is why Mars? Why are we going to Mars? Uh, Mars is about half the size of, uh, of Earth and it's uh, our neighbor. So it, you know, you can say it's your, there's always an interest in understanding what's happening in your neighbor's place. But also it is because uh, we can access Mars. We can also try to learn about it, and we would learn a lot about Earth as well. So, um, so these missions to Mars have been ongoing. NASA have been having this Mars exploration uh, program for many years. In fact, the first rover that landed on Mars was Sojourner in 1997. It didn't last very long, but it did. Uh, it did actually land on Mars, and it did get a little bit some data for on Mars. You can see the size there. Uh, this is uh, just at the bottom of the steps at JPL. Uh, so it gives you an idea. A few years later, Spirit Opportunity in 2004, what's the rover that looked like that? Slightly bigger, a little bit more sophisticated. And uh, same thing, landed on Mars, uh, but uh, uh, lasted, I guess, about 60 days or so and provided some data, but uh, and, then, and then stopped. Uh, now we move to Curiosity in 2012, and you can see the difference in size. So it's a one ton, Curiosity is a one ton rover. It's a very sophisticated robot. It has uh, 10 instruments that actually landed on Mars and is still going on Mars. So, and Perseverance comes later, comes actually this year, and I'll show a picture of Perseverance later on. But I just want to say that the two missions, the Curiosity and the Perseverance missions, are complementary to one to, to each other and in fact they're complementary also with sojourner and spirit the, the idea being uh, to look of to have some science to, to to follow some science objectives one of which is to look for science of life to look for if, if mars is habitable as a planet or was habitable at some point in time so so first let's focus a little bit about curiosity and let's try to see what what we learned. So this is the robot and the rover that we're going to look into and before we move to perseverance. So before we do that, we would like to understand what is or what are the scientific goals of Curiosity. So the rover is called Curiosity. The science mission is called the Mars Science Laboratory. So, so there's a mission, Mars Science Laboratory. There's a rover called Curiosity. And the goals of curiosity are really, the first goal is to evaluate, to assess Mars biological potential uh, for, for, search, for searches, for features that might record biological processes. So essentially, we're trying to see if there is some way of knowing a little bit, more, a little bit about Mars, but precisely, or, or more precisely, or specifically, about biological processes. Also, to... To, to actually characterize the geology of the landing sites where we landed. So where we land is important, and Curiosity landed in a site called uh, the Gale Crater. So essentially is to characterize that, that site and to, to know it more from geological point, point of view. And then also to investigate the processes that might indicate the habitability. And when we talk about habitability, we will see, and you will hear this word a lot, water. It's really to look or search for the presence of water on Mars. And clearly also characterize the environment in terms of uh, hazards if, uh, if, if, if we ever want to send humans to, to Mars. So these are the broad scientific goals of the Mars Science Laboratory mission. And with that, I would like to mention one thing that I think is important. When we say the goal 
of the scientific the goals of the of of the MSL the Mars Science Laboratory is not really to search for life per se, but actually to look for the, if the conditions for Mar for for life exist on on Mars. So really, there's a difference between looking for life and looking for the conditions that life uh, that life might exist, and uh, that's what MSL is. In fact, uh, if you go to the website of NASA headquarters and you look for for the mass exploration program, which is a program that oversees all of these Mars uh, exploration programs, you will see that actually following the water is really the, the motto that actually drives this program. So essentially, we're going to look also, a key point is to look for water on Mars. But before we talk about that, I would like to mention that, you know, when we, when you want to go to Mars, you want to go to a specific place. And you want to go to a specific place because that's where you enhance your chances of, of actually meeting your scientific goals. If you're going to look for water in, on Earth, the chances of you finding water is probably a lot higher if you go to London than if you go to Tindouf, which is in the south in the Sahara, where it's really, really dry and there's not much water there. So, so the same thing on Mars. So if you want to go to Mars, people have studied the, the surface of Mars and have studied Mars for many years, you would like to go to some places where you think you have a high chance. So, so first, people, scientists select the landing site. And this landing ellipse here, it's, you can see, it's relatively small. It's about, I think, 25 kilometers by 20 kilometers. And this is after a journey of 300 million kilometers or so. So really, the precision of, of to land here is, in my opinion, is truly amazing. And I think it is thanks to science that this can be done. And I'll try very, very simply uh, to explain in the next slide uh, to tell you how it happens. So when you want to navigate to a specific place so far away, well, clearly you cannot use a, uh, uh, a meter stick or something like that to, to, to find a distance and to keep it and so forth. It's, uh, it's, it's impossible. So what happens? So how is, because measuring the distance to know exactly where your where your rover is or whatever is flying or satellite is, uh, is, is very, very important. So the distance, knowing the distance is extremely important. But knowing the distance means knowing the distance precisely. So if I go back a little bit and to give you an analogy, I just did an analogy for how, what is an analogy between going from Earth to Mars to this landing site with this precision? It's literally like if I ask you to, set, to, to throw a penny from Boston to, to, to San Francisco and ask that that penny actually lands literally on a plate. So that type of analogy will give you an idea of the precision that, that we were looking for. So to do this, what scientists do is clearly they, they, they use, instead of measuring the distance directly, they use time. Time is very, very important. Clearly plays a key role because the distance we know is the velocity times the time. So typically you send uh, an electromagnetic wave, which is a radio wave from Earth to your object and then receive it back. And, you, and then you measure the time that, you know, for the, for, for, for the wave to go and come back, for the electromagnetic wave to go and come back, and, and you measure the time that. Clearly, the time then has to be very precise. And the more precise the time is, the smaller that ellipse is or that landing site can be. And to do that, people use, or today, uh, for this work, um, using at the most accurate at at atomic clocks, which are really the result of a lot of work in laser spectroscopy and laser technology. And it, provi and it, and it, is, it uses a cesium atomic clock with an error of one second in every 100 million years. So you can tell you, I, I, I don't have the time to explain how this goes, but really, literally, you can see here that three beams coming three di from three directions, X, Y, and Z direction, to reduce the temperature and essentially slow down the cesium atoms. And then there's a technology that actually allows people to define time very, very precisely. So that's actually what allowed and what allows these landing sites to be as small as they are and to be successful. It's a major, major contribution. So again, you can see fundamental science here playing a key role in actually allowing navigation not just to Mars but 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 you know even on Earth here. 
So curiosity, curiosity is a rover, it's a one-ton rover. Uh, it's just like a small, small vehicle, if you wish. And it has 10 instruments. And these instruments have been carefully selected to answer some of those questions, scientific questions that I just uh, went through uh, a minute ago or two minutes ago. And the instruments, these 10 instruments, uh, I will group them into what we would call remote instruments, i.e. instruments that you could use to, to, to analyze a sample or a rock or, or, or dust on Mars without having to touch that, that rock, without having to be close to it. And these are uh, uh, instruments that use uh, imaging and lasers and so forth. Other type of instruments are contact instruments, where actually you have to take, move the rover, go to the to, to the rock or to the sample that you want to to interrogate to to analyze, and and you do it that way. And then we have in situ uh, instruments. These are instruments that require for uh, for samples to be brought back to the rover put into the rover and measured, uh, measured within the rover, and then the data is, is, is analyzed and sent to Earth, back to Earth. So, so I'm going to focus on this part of the instrument, as I said, because it, the 10 instruments, clearly I cannot talk about all 10 instruments, but I just want to mention that all these instruments work in, in, in complementarity. So the data from one helps the other one and so forth. For example, we have, we have here a weather instrument that actually measures the pressure and the temperature uh, on Mars on a daily basis, wherever we are, and that that data is actually uh, needed for what we do for the analysis of what we do with this instrument. So I'm going to focus on the instrument that's here, the ChemCam instrument, uh, in, in 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 this talk. So so the goal of these instruments really are really to 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 compare really to be able to compare rocks. Uh, on Mars, so we have when we see something from far, uh, just with an image, the question becomes: Is that is that rock interesting or not? And then how do you compare it? So you compare it to a library of rocks that exist on Earth. So there's a library of of, of 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 rocks, and this library is available, and we compare it to them so to know exactly what they are. So and and we want to do that very very fast because then you decide whether something's interesting or not interesting and move on. And then also to be able to do truly a quantitative composition of these rocks. What's in those rocks? How iron? Well, how much iron is it is in there? Silicon? How much silicon? How much titanium? And so forth. So we want to be able to quantify that with this instrument. We also, because it's a laser and it's high energy, it can actually drill a little bit. So it can it can drill about a millimeter in 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 uh, in, so, in, uh, in rocks and a few centimeters in soils by actually hitting the laser again and again, you drill a little bit. I can show you some pictures of that later on. So that drilling is very important. And because that drilling allows you to see a little bit below the, the, the surface, so just slightly below the surface, and then learn a little bit of what's happening below the surface, which actually tells us quite a lot also about, uh, about the history of, of the sample itself. And also the instrument will take some images of what we have seen. So basically, this is what it looks like. So we have 10 instruments on, on Mars. So these 10 instruments, some of them, as I say, contact. So when it's a contact instrument, the, the rover has to move. Moving the rover is not an easy job. It's very difficult because the terrain is hard and so forth. So the, so the instrument, the ChemCam instrument I'm talking about, is the first one, it's the funnel. It's the one that actually does not have to move, it's remote, and you can, you can analyze targets uh, that are seven meters away, up to seven meters away. So you can shoot, there's something interesting, and to do the analysis. And then if it's interesting, if we need, for example, an X-ray machine to go there and touch it and do contact measurements, uh, we will. Then if it's needed to bring it into, then, then then it's a little bit. So you can see that this instrument is the instrument that actually has maybe the most data because we look at anything that people tell us we look good at, and we don't need to move the rover. Uh, uh, for anything that's uh, within seven meters. And then it moves down. So really it's like a funnel like this. Uh, this is very rapid and these are a little bit more time consuming and, and, and are involve a little bit more uh, work with a rover on Mars. So, so the ChemCam instrument simply said and simply explained is this. 
it, it's, it has a laser, an infrared laser. It's a pulse. It's a laser pulse. So it's about a few nanoseconds, five to 10 nanoseconds laser. So it's really a lot of energy, a lot of optical energy that's concentrated and focused in time, uh, concentrated in time in a very short period of time. So it's like a burst of, of, of light, but very high energy. And that burst of light then shoots to a target, any target on, 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 uh, on, uh, on Mars. So that because it's high energy, it is high enough to break down that, 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 that compound or that, that material. And then it creates a plasma. A plasma is a four state of, of, uh, of matter. It's really a collection of ions and, and neutrals and so forth at high temperature. So it burns, it burns it. So you can see here. I'm going to show you, and then, sorry, and then when, when it burns it and the plasma actually is formed, it's really, really hot. It reaches temperatures of 10,000 degree Kelvin, uh, and, and that's why it, it boils and, and, uh, and, and creates this, this hole in here. Then, uh, then it interacts with the atmosphere, and it emits, as it interacts, it cools down, and it emits some light. So the light is emitted and uh, we pick it up. It could be various colors of light, but, uh, but not it's emitted. And, and you can see here with these two pictures, here's one target prior to shooting it with a laser, and this is after shooting it. This is about, these are about 400 micron size uh, holes, and this is shooting about 30 times in each of these, 30 or 50, in, uh, I think it's 30 for each of them. So you shoot and you can see, depending on the hardness of the material, you can drill through it a little bit. And then we collect these, what we call a spectrum, and you will hear this word spectrum quite a lot, and we get things like this, where actually this is a measure of the color, oops, sorry, measure of the color of the plasma, so measure of what we are seeing, and this is its intensity, how, how intense it is. And each, then it's like really finger digital, you know, it's like we each have a, 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 a a digital print, if you want, signature. So each atom, if you will, uh, has one specific signature here. And we can then find out whether it's titanium or iron or manganese or calcium or anything else. So essentially, through this process, we have the elemental composition of the material that we are interested in looking at. So basically, in, in an illustration, what it looks like, a laser shoots on a sample, a plasma is created. We have something called, we call a spectrograph, where we get these, these signatures that allow us to say what are the elements that are in there. And here's, for example, some, some materials, aluminum, uh, aluminum, copper, and basalt, which is a type of a rock. And you can see that actually they are different colors. They burn differently, or the plasma is different. And that's really what we use. And then those colors are really divided, just like uh, you would do it with, with any spectrograph. And then from there, we get these signatures, and then we know exactly whether it has what elements are in there. This is something that gives us not only the, the qualitative composition of the sample, but as I said, it can also give us the uh, quantitative component of the sample. And the beauty of all of this, you have one laser shot, and you get in almost essentially the entire periodic table, whatever is in that sample. You're not choosing just light elements or, or heavy elements. You choose, you, it, 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 you get a signal from any element that's in the periodic table. Some of course are more sensitive than others, but you will get everything. So this is actually the first spectrum you can see here that was shot on Mars. Curiosity, and you can see that we have seen, you know, all these elements that you can see: manganese, silicon, aluminium, calcium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the interesting point also we have seen, even the first, first, you know, few years ago, was actually we saw some hydrogen and oxygen, and we've seen also. Uh, then you do some analysis and you figure out what is that hydrogen and oxygen? Is it likely that it was uh, from water? And after so much work, and not just this, not just uh, from this instrument, but in actually working with the other instruments and particularly the X-ray instrument and so forth, we came to the conclusion that actually it was from water, and that was published a few years ago. So, 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 so essentially, this instrument contributed to 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 the discovery of water uh, on Mars, but not by itself, of course. 
So another uh, another uh, uh, another interesting result is that I'm trying to look at my time how much I have, but is that if you look at if you look on the left hand side. It's actually an image of, that, of a sample that we looked at on Mars. And what you can see here is these are called veins. And these are veins here, and these are veins also uh, on Earth. So this is, I think, Nina's knife, but this is on Earth. So these here, it's really, we were wondering whether this is calcium deposits. It's like in your kitchen, if you have too much calcium, at some point the calcium deposits in the, in, in, in the, in the tubes and so forth, and then it, it, where water flows, and after so many years, you, know, you just get these calcium deposits there. So we were interested in looking at that. So again, we took a laser and uh, shot in there. It was not easy to shoot because you have to be very precise inside in th these veins to see. You can see the vein here barely there. And on this, it was a lot easier. And, and, and sure enough, it was calcium, uh, calcium sulfate, sulfate veins, which actually then uh, proved also that probably water flew through here over the years. So I won't have time to go through all the results we have with or had with, with curiosity, but just want to say that actually, if we want, I'm just trying to summarize here what we have. So... So after, when you look at all the data that we've had since 2012 with all the instruments, not just ChemCam, with all the instruments, I think there's a picture that starts to build up. The picture is that uh, uh, the Gale Crater, where we landed on Mars, that region here, probably looked like this. It was long-lasting liquid water, so there's probably in the past there was water. And uh, it, we found also all, all the, the, the building blocks of, of life, if you will, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphate, sulfur, boron, and all of these have been found. So now the question you can from there starts to build up a, a, a picture of, of what Mars looked like. So... And I just want to say that Curiosity is still working, still exploring the, the, the Gale Crater since it landed. It, 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 has, um, it has traveled about 20 kilometers, uh, but in 20 kilometers, we've got so much data that allows us to come to the picture where, where we are. So today, it's, it's, it's about here in, the, in, in this area. So I uh, just want to tell you that it is still working and still getting data to us. So, so maybe modern Mars looks like this, and maybe in the past 3.6 billion years ago, Mars looked like it was rich in water. So what I want to show you next is a very short video that actually shows you, was done by one of our colleagues, to show you what Mars probably looked like 3.6 or 4 billion years ago. So please, it's not too long. I hope you can hear the sound. The music is beautiful. And uh, oops. Thank you. 
So, um, so, so that's what Mars looked like. We think Mars looked like, or at least what the data actually suggests Mars looked like a few billion years ago. Now, I have said to you before that actually one of the key things that we do is to compare what we see on Mars, right, to compare it to a library. So I just briefly want to explain how that works. For those of you who are in machine learning, I'm sorry if this is extremely simple, and I hope it's correct, but I just want to give you a flavor on how that works. So, so it's initially before, before, uh, before landing, we developed a library. So there's a library that actually we, have, we look at various samples, various rocks, I've seen so many rocks in my lab too, and we measure them and we try to see what their spectral signatures are. And uh, we, we, we do all sorts of things in the lab to make sure that we are sure. So then that becomes part of the library that we could use for, for modeling and for predicting things in, in the future. When we go to Mars, we do the same things. We do measure, we try to measure the same thing, et cetera. The only problem with Mars compared to the lab, not the only, but one of the big problems is that on, in the lab here on Earth, we can actually measure the distance exactly will be at the distance that we want between the laser and the instruments and, 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 and the samples itself. On Mars, that's not so always easy. We have sometimes to measure things that, uh, which are maybe two meters away, maybe five meters away, maybe seven meters away, maybe three meters away. And that we cannot control depending on the, uh, on, on the environment and so forth. So that is something that actually is what we call distance correction it needs to take place. And it's not an easy problem to, 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 to tackle. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then we compare all of these, right, with other instruments, but also we, these are the future. This is for perseverance. We did it. So now how does the comparison work? So let's take the calibration targets we have on Curiosity. You've got, we have 10 calibration targets, i.e. 10 targets that we think are key to understand and to compare to. So we need to compare what we have, what we see on Mars to these targets. How is, it, how is the, this classification or this comparison done? So to do that, to explain it, I hope uh, uh, in simple terms, I'm, I'm going to do this. We use something what, com what computer scientists called K nearest neighbors. Um, so the nearest neighbors, K is a number of, of, of uh, a number of samples that if you want, data points that you have. And the basic approach is to find patterns between what you're measuring and your training set or your library. So that's what we do. And then we, we, we would try to figure out which, where these things, these things belong. And then there is a much vote. It's easier to, to play it. So here we have first example. We have, for example, green dots and red dots. And we're trying to find if one thing we just measured comes to this place. How is that a green or a red one? And you can guess. So you can say that it's probably closest to, to the red if we take uh, three Keiko Sui, meaning we take three nearest neighbors. So three nearest neighbors, we just decide to take three nearest neighbors. Then this one here, we have two votes versus one. So we can, we can probably say that the unknown, this one, is the vote is two to one is a red red button a red dot good so then we move and we do the same thing play the same game again k equals three to not to make things complicated so now we vote three and the nearest the nearest the distance the shortest distance to this one is three green ones and that actually means it's green you would agree then we do this game play this game again and we ask again the nearest neighbors, one, two, three, red. But maybe we would say all anything that falls within this box is red, just to simplify our algorithm. So anything that actually comes, we're going to divide along this x-axis. So anything that actually comes into this box is going to be red. And anything that comes into this box is going to be green. Maybe it makes sense. Maybe it doesn't make sense. So, but then if you have one that comes here, Right, it is in the in, in the red box. So the idea is that yeah, it is red. But then if you actually look carefully at three nearest neighbors, it's green. So so that doesn't really work very well with this with 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 the with, the, with what we've just assumed about the box. So so the choice of how you do this is very very important. So at some point 
If you choose just three, you might have two to one. If you choose more, you might have a different result. The same thing if your library has a mistake. So if, for example, all red ones are here, but the green one, for some reason, just got itself into this position rather than the other side, well, that also will create a problem because you are probably in a red zone, but with one, I would call an outlier, who just is there in the library and doesn't work. So this actually, this game here, now imagine you don't have, you know, 10 or 15 or three nearest neighbors, but we've got thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of spectra that we have, that we receive, and many, many rocks. And uh, so the question is, how do you do all of that work in such a way that we can classify this? So, so this is just to tell you a little bit how important it is to have a library that we can rely on uh, that is um, well, well um, characterized, but also as free of errors and outliers as possible. And it's not as simple as one thing. So many laboratories in the US, in France, that actually work on this and um, that actually try to get the library that we need and, um, and, and in Germany too. And, and, and that's, that's a big, big, big uh, part of this work. Pre, pre going uh, before we go, because then there's a decision which ones you would take there with you so that you can also shoot on Mars to seeing under different environment what, what, what you, what you have and what you find. So now I'd like to talk, I said to you that when we do something in the lab is one thing, when we do it on Mars is another thing because of distance, we cannot control the distance. And the student here, you can see Alir, he's a student at UMass Lowell, he's working on this problem here, he's been working on this, he's done a great job. Alir has been working on this, and the reason it's a problem, because if you look at light or even sound, you know, the, if you go further and further and further, the, the, the intensity of the sound or the intensity of the light has a tendency to, to grow with, with distance. And as a result, per unit area, if you will, if you're receiving just a detector here, then it, it drops. So this is a problem. And it then this problem, if it's not solved, you can get the wrong prediction for 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 uh, for, for compositions. So so um, to make these things even more complicated, uh, the laser is not really a point source like this. It's a, it's what we call a Gaussian beam. It's focused, and Alir has been doing a great job doing this and has been successful. Uh, Ebo, who is also from UMass Lowell, is a postdoc, has been looking at plasma formation in the lab. It's, it's, it, it's the same plasma under the same condition, looks like this, but when it's expanded on Mars, it's expanded because the pressure is less, so it's, it's a little bit, diff little bit different, and we've been able to, to do these simulations. So with the simulations, they help us a lot. So these are the calibration targets on Curiosity, and the simulations help us to see, to, to see to calculate what we would expect to see from a rock. And these are, for example, simulations. And it, not just that, it also allows us, if the intensity of the laser on Mars, we think it's about 1.2 gigawatts, so this is just you know, how intense is the laser. But there's no way to measure it on Mars to figure out, why well, is it truly what we think it is or not? We can't measure that. So we have an indirect way of measuring it through the simulations, and these bars here tells us if we're outside of those bars, there's probably a problem like here or here or here or here. And then we have to look. And we've corrected some of the issues just by doing things uh, of this nature. Um, so now let me come to perseverance. So this is ChemCam. This is perseverance. They look very much alike. But there are seven instruments here. And, and the instrument that we, what we called ChemCam here is SuperCam. So what's the goal of perseverance? So curiosity, just to remind you in a nutshell, was to evaluate the biological potential, to characterize the geology, and to, to, to study Mars parts habit, habitability, looking for water, and to characterize human hazards on Mars. Perseverance is to explore the geology of a, a different landing site, the Jezero site, and assess again the, uh, the, the habitability of, of that site, and seeks again for signs of ancient life, and also to gather samples that could be returned to Earth by a future mission, and demonstrate 
uh, robotic and human exploration. So, so again, they're complementary. So this is what Perseverance looks like. It has seven instruments. Again, I don't have time to go through all of these. It has this, the images, I think, uh, well, I can't remember the number, but 93 or something, okay, cameras, uh, super cam, laser, same thing. It has, um, but, th but this laser this time takes, uh, can go up to 12 meters, and it can do another technology where will tell us about not only about the elements themselves only, but also about the molecular uh, comp compositions of, of, of the samples. So there's something called Raman spectroscopy that's being used. Uh, we still measure the environment uh, on Mars. And there is also a uh, proximity instrument. So an instrument actually can measure, can dig, can, can do some, some, some work. And you can see the helicopter here that is going to be tested for, for, for a measurement. Um, there is also a, a ground penetrating radar, and there is also MOXIE, which is an instrument to produce oxygen on Mars from carbon uh, dioxide. The atmosphere of Mars is mostly carbon dioxide, 96%. So the idea here uh, is to actually use that carbon dioxide to produce oxygen uh, for, for, for humans on Mars or for future missions and so forth. And this instrument is led by PI in Massachusetts at MIT. Uh, Professor Hack, uh, Hashed. So the, 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 sample, uh, the samples will be uh, returns. They look like this. They're about one centimeter, one centimeter uh, in diameter and about 20, I think, in length. And what these are, if we find something that's truly interesting, but we don't have the instruments to analyze those samples, then they will be left in some places on Mars for future mission to go and get them back to Earth. Uh, so that's future missions. So again, uh, just like I said, what was true for the Gale Crater, where you land on Mars is very important. It's the same thing here. It went to Jezero Crater. And the Jezero Crater, after five years of, 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 of thinking and by, by the scientists that, belong, that work on this mission, uh, decided that this is the place to go for an obvious reason, and that is because the surface uh, looks like this, and, um, and there is a good uh, reason to believe this was an ancient crater uh, filled with water, or these are the inlets and the outlets of the water. So that's why that site was, 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 uh, was selected. So as you know, or you may know, but the launch uh, took place July 30th, 2021, and we landed in February 2021. So I'll show you a short video again of uh, what happened during the landing. So there we go. Applicate, indicate, shoot, deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed. Sky team maneuver has started. About 20 meters off the surface. Ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. Uh, so this is a slide of uh, what uh, when Perseverance uh, first uh, is unpacking and getting ready to uh, to do a science mission. And uh, this is uh, one of the first pictures uh, taken by Perseverance uh, in the far field. So you can see what it looks like. And this is the first spectrum of Perseverance working and taken at a distance of 3.17 meters. Again, it looks all the spectra look the same to you, to maybe you, if you don't look at them, but to us, they're really, really different. And we try to, to get these signatures to understand what, uh, what's, uh, what's in Jazeera crater right now. This is the first and uh, the first uh, spectrum that was uh, collected uh, recently. Um, so what we'll be looking for, we'll be looking for a perseverance for fossils and we'll be looking for things of signatures of life and, 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 and um, I'm not going to be here 
trying to, to define what life is. But essentially, we're going to look for microbial sig biosignatures. We find something like this that would be great, and, uh, and we, will, we will then analyze that with the various instruments that we have. Um, because again, rocks keep, uh, keep signs of past life. So that's the idea. I just want to mention something that uh, we, we've done in the lab. So we've taken a mud with E. coli. You can see this is an AFM, uh, atomic force microscope picture of E. coli, uh, very, very little E. coli in, in, in mud. And this is after we sonic take it and, and actually after we try to kill them with radiation uh, and see what it is. So our idea for us is not that to look for something like this, is to see in this process of, 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 of getting E. coli radiate, irradiated and, and, and heated up and so forth and, and the various conditions, is to see whether the spectroscopy, we can see some signatures. And we have seen a few signatures uh, that we published in 2015 um, uh, with, with, again, with lasers, uh, using lasers uh, and trying to look at the ratio of the various elements moving from one to the other and so forth. Uh, this, I just want to say also some, this has applications at least uh, in many, many areas. I just want to mention two things. For me in my lab, we also use the same ideas uh, using machine learning, uh, using uh, laser spectroscopy, various laser spectroscopies to, to study another complex environment. Mars is complex, but also blood is complex. And what we try to do is to find uh, uh, really signs that um, there's early signs of diseases. And we've worked on melanoma, we've worked on ovarian cancer with a postdoc, Rosalba Godioso, uh, and we've found some, uh, some, we've had some good successes, but it's not finished. This is a work ongoing. Another application I want to, 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 uh, to, to, to mention is an application from one of our, my friend and, and, and colleague, uh, Pablo, who's decided to start the company based on what we're doing here. And I just did a video, will tell you exactly what he does. And uh, the reason I'm showing you these is applications of, uh, of some of the technologies that have been developed by this, because often people ask, you know, what is it from this big science, what are we getting out of it? And uh, there are a lot of applications, I'll just give you two examples, what are applications of science and uh, in, 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 because in my opinion, science is the seed of new technologies. So then it's a matter of time before those seeds actually flourish and uh, give some fruit. So with that, I'll stop here. Again, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for your, uh, your support, all of you. And, but I want in particular and uh, thank Eric and Lola Chesson for their support and their sponsorship and their friendship as well. So really, it's very nice to have met them and to know them. I want to thank uh, all my staff at the Kennedy College of Sciences, I, everybody, and particularly this call who put this together. I want to thank also the University of Massachusetts for helping all the help that we do, all offices that are helping us, and all the funding that we have for science. And I want to thank all the people of science. And I just want to say one thing, science knows no borders. Thank you so much. All right, great job. That was awesome, Noradine. Um, I, I was speaking with some of our, uh, my office mates during the beginning of the lecture and we came to the realization that this was our first time hearing a detailed, um, a detailed talk about your research. Um, so we're really happy that we, we got to attend as well. Um, so we're going to move on to the Q&A portion. I don't know if you wanna stop sharing your screen or not, you don't have to. Um, 
and I'm just going to go back and forth between the Q&As that are live and the ones that we've received um, through registration. And I know we're probably going to go over. So if anyone needs to leave, um, feel free to just pop off. Um, this is being recorded and the link for the, um, for the webinar will be emailed out to everyone um, to watch um, as soon as it becomes available. So are you ready? Yep. Our first question, um, what will what happened to all the water on Mars and could it happen to Earth as well? That's a very, very good question. So so that's a big question. I, I, I don't have an answer to it, but that is the question is where did the water go? So the idea is that, you know, there's probably possibly uh, it went uh, underground somewhere. Uh, but uh, but that's a part of uh, one of the questions that the team is trying to to uh, to answer, uh, so it's uh, it's 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 a major question. Uh, so stay tuned. I don't know. I don't have the answer to it, and I don't think anybody does too. So I hope if I unmuted myself, um, what is the atmospheric pressure of Mars? So Mars is about uh, six to ten millibars, depending where you are on the day, roughly speaking. So it's uh, it's it's very much much lower than the pressure on on Earth. Um, and it's uh, that's why it's so hard to fly, and it's uh, it makes it also the plasma, like we showed those picture, expands a lot more. So it's it's so there's less pressure on the plasma, so it goes and 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 grows and grows uh, as as, as uh, uh, more than on Earth. This is um, one that kind of ties into Matt's talk from Tuesday evening. Um, did we bring COVID nineteen to Mars? Um, slash, did COVID nineteen come from Mars? Well, the second part is easy, and so is the first part. But the second part, no, there's no way, because how can COVID-19 come from Mars when nothing has come back from Mars yet? So, uh, But in terms of, of, of sending COVID or anything else, the, the rovers uh, uh, that are sent to for planetary missions by NASA are really, really sterilized. Uh, I think the samples that you've seen for the sample return, for example, are have been characterized as the cleanest uh, materials probably ever produced. So they are, uh, there's a lot of work that gets done before uh, for sterilization to make sure that we're not sending something there because if we're looking for life and we send a bacterium or something like that up there, then clearly you'll be seeing what you have sent there. That's not the idea. So, so, um, so the answer is no, there, there is no COVID one way or the other and, and nothing also of that nature. Okay. Um, what is the source of energy for the rovers? It's a nuclear uh, plutonium uh, battery. So for both. Uh, so it's, uh, so it was supposed to last for curiosity. I think it was supposed to last for two years um, and it's lasting now close to, let's say eight years or so. So it's, uh, uh, it's lasting a lot longer than it was what it was guaranteed for. So it's still, uh, but I think there is a sh there is eventually, you know, uh, uh, an end to it. I think it's ten years. I think I can't remember, but uh, but yeah, but it's plutonium. Okay. Um, let's see. Did the ChemCam detect any molecular oxygen on Mars? Income by itself does not detect molecular oxygen, but we in, in in collaboration with the other instruments. Yeah, uh, yeah. There is, there is, a, there is a presence of oxygen, organic oxygen. Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there a practical way to send people to Mars and manage the radiation problems, or is it all robots in the foreseeable future? So, um, I am sure there is a way to to send humans and 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 protect them from radiation on Mars. The issue is how much of a problem it is. It's a big problem. And how much do you want to spend to do that? Uh, this is my personal point of view, just my view. I think robots are improving tremendously. Uh, there's a tremendous uh, improvement in robotics. And I think uh, we are going to see, uh, we're going to live in an era where space exploration is done more by robots than by humans. Uh, now humans might go for different reason, but I think to do science and to explore Mars itself, I really think uh, that robots uh, are the way to go because of, uh, the, again, the development that they were seeing with robotics and also because of the expense that, uh, and, you know, playing life of human beings is not the same as life of a robot. 
at least in my mind. Okay. Um, this question kind of links back to um, the first question, or actually one of the one of the first questions about um, where the water went. Um, could the water have been blown off by solar wind? Uh, I I never say never to things that make sense. So uh, it's possible, but I think um, you know it's uh, something that um, I'm not uh, an expert in that area, and uh, people probably should look into it and try to answer that question uh, if, uh, if that's something of, of interest. Yeah. Okay. Um, have you encountered a chemical signature on Mars that you cannot identify? Uh, no, we haven't identified something we, we okay, the, the ones we have identified that we have not been able to identify are the ones we haven't been able to identify also on Earth, because there's some signatures that are pretty difficult to say where they come from, because the physics is still not there where it should be. But to say something that is on Mars uh, and not on Earth, no, uh, not to my knowledge, at least. Again, that for those of you interested, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of data of spectra. So I'm just talking about the ones that we looked at uh, so far. There's probably enough data there for um, uh, 10 years of PhD thesis on this subject, if anybody's interested. And they are actually in the public domain. So, but, uh, but we haven't looked at everything clearly. Um. Is there any information at this time about the stable isotope ratios of CHONPS on Mars, which are the dominant elements or building blocks of life on Earth? So there is a team, the Dan team, that actually works on that. And I think they've published a few things. I'm not a member of that team. And um, I am not sure they did all the elements of the isotopes, but they did look at uh, some of these questions about uh, isotopic uh, signatures. Um, so, but um, I'm I'm not in a position to say what what they found. I, I just I just don't know. Not I'm not on that team directly. Um, is there a possibility of finding a new element on Mars? Um, I don't see how, to be honest. So I'm not sure why. What, how the new element will come up. And uh, so far, we haven't seen anything that is indicative of any element that is unknown. And there is no, no reason or no mechanism, no mechanism that I know of that would, will, would suggest that there's a possibility of finding a new element on Mars. All right. Um, why is NASA focusing more on Mars exploration than studying our other planetary neighbor, Venus? Oh, Venus is also of interest. So there is actually a mission to Venus that's uh, being planned. Um, so both are, are, are of interest. Our neighbors are, are very interesting. So, 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 so there, is a, um, there is a Venus uh, mission. In fact, the Venus mission also will probably have a, uh, a lip system or laser system as well. So. Um, and on the topic of lasers, what kind of laser is in chem ChemCam? It's a it's a it, it's a it's a pulsed laser, solid state laser. Uh, the material is called ND YAG or KW, but it's a neodymium YAG laser. Uh, emits light in the infrared at near 1064, 1072, I think, and it produces energies of about 20 millijoules in seven nanoseconds. So 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 it is a, a solid state pulsed uh, YAG laser. Neodymium. All right, we have two more questions so far. Um, how has Martian magnetic field varied over time? I don't know. And uh, for those who are interested, again, I think we can probably find the, uh, some information, but I do not know. All right, and the last question, um, what has the laser analysis of the green slash blue rock shown? So when you do an analysis with, with rocks that are quote unquote blue and, and so forth, you find different elements that are in one and the other. So it's, 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 we learn a lot more about those, those, uh, those rocks than, than if we didn't. So, so it has shown, you know, the elements that exist in one versus the other one and how they compare. Uh, clearly, I can't remember which elements is in which, but, uh, but, uh, but also sometimes it's not just the, uh, 
the elements, but it's a ratio of elements that's important. And that's uh, something that allows us to, to understand the composition on Mars and to understand what, uh, what there is there. All right, and I think, I think that might be it for our questions. You crushed them. Um, oh. Yes, yeah, so um, unless anyone has any, hold on, I think one more. Um, no, it's more of a, a statement that came through about the, the green blue rock. Um, so we just wanted to thank everyone for attending today. Um, and again, a special thank you to Eric and Lola Chason for sponsoring um, these kind of lectures for the college. Um, They've been amazing to get the scientific community aware of what's going on in the college and just out, um, out in the scientific world. Um, and we also wanted to thank Matt, who unfortunately had to step off for um, giving his time to do um, Nora Dean's intro and thank Nora Dean, of course, for giving this wonderful lecture and um, everyone who attended. And we hope you have a wonderful weekend and um, stay curious. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much.